All right, so just like normal, um, if you're not speaking, if you can please keep yourself muted, feel free to ask questions in the chat. And especially as we have the presentations today, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question of your teammates, that would be great. We really appreciate the feedback back and forth. Um, and so just a quick outline of the agenda today, we're just gonna cover a few additional resources and then go through some last minute housekeeping items for wrapping up this course, and then give you all a chance to tell your adaptation story and give your presentations. And so, as I mentioned, if one person from your team who's presenting or who will be sharing their slides can let Maddie or I know, then we can make you a co-host so that you have the ability to share your screen. And then we'll just wrap up with some next steps and where we plan on going from here. So that's basically the outline for today. And so um, I'm going to just hand it off to Christian, and he's going to talk about some different carbon sequestration tools that are out there. Thanks, Courtney. Um, I, I didn't want to take much time. I just wanted to let folks know that um, there is uh, a source of wall-to-wall um, -wall products for the state of Hawaii. Um, this is just Hawaii Island depicted here. Um, but all of these variables um, that you see listed and others um, are, um, uh, they're data sets that can be um, integrated into a portfolio, very similar to what Ryan has been sharing with all of you, but focus on carbon. And so if there's interest in um, carbon sequestration opportunities um, on your land, and you would like baseline information and potentially even some yeah. insight into carbon sequestration, um, please uh, let me know, um, maybe via email. And I'm gonna put my email in the chat um, and I can help to organize that with uh, Ryan and Abby. And that's it. Awesome, thanks Christian. And then I wasn't sure if you wanted to cover this slide or not. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, this is a, um, a, a depiction of um, uh, land units stewarded by conservation organizations uh, on Oahu and on Hawaii Island. And what this image um, uh, shows is uh, variation in carbon sequestration potential across units. And it's an index that we developed to give you a sense for how much potential your, your land base has for sequestering carbon. And it's sensitive to um, how much productivity um, you, you can achieve on your, on your land. And this is determined through direct measurements of um, productivity from satellites. Um, it, it looks at above ground carbon density, which is modeled um, and measured. Uh, and then it also looks at forest cover. And that's um, something that's been mapped as well. And so when you combine these three things, you can get an idea of how much sequestration potential you have. So for example, if you have very low forest cover, blue, um, and go ahead and hit the, um, the space bar, Courtney. Um, so if you have very low force cover, but high um, uh, productivity and low above ground carbon density, that is very similar to like a productive, say um, uh, grass uh, dominated area. Um, and so that, unit right there that's circled for Hawaii Island and the unit circle for Oahu might be a unit that stands out as having high sequestration potential. Uh, go ahead and hit the space bar. Um, in contrast, if you already have a lot of forest cover and you already have high above ground carbon density, um, and in this case, you also have high primary production, that unit might actually be better um, viewed as uh, a, a carbon rich ecosystem that's worth protecting. And um, this work is you know, something that is done not just at the whole management unit level, but 
um, the the information can get can be refined down to 30 meter by 30 meter resolution, um, and so you can have two really different um, 30 meter by 30 meter um, areas right next to each other. So anyway, this is the kind of information that we can provide um, baseline information, but also this sequestration index. So yeah, thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Christian. Does anyone have questions about this tool? I'm not hearing any, but Christian did put his email in the chat. So you can always reach out to him if you have additional questions or would like more information on how this will work for your project. So thanks again for presenting that, Christian. I appreciate it. All right, so um, wrapping things up for this course, again, congratulations. Thank you all so much for your participation over the last eight weeks. We really appreciate it. And it's been great for all of us to learn from all of you about the climate change impacts that you're dealing with and your adaptation efforts that you're considering and how to monitor for them into the future. And so just a few last minute things. If you have a chance, we'd really appreciate your feedback um, through the course evaluation. So that's been sent out, I think, in the newsletters and a couple of emails. And we'll send one more email after this session is over today with just a few of these last minute reminders and that link to the survey as well. But we would appreciate your feedback on what worked, what didn't work, what would you like to see done differently if we do this again in the future? Those sorts of things would be really helpful. And then if anyone is interested in some of those continuing edu education credits through either the Society of American Foresters or through the International Society of Arboricultures, we do have credits for this course for both of those. So there's a form to fill out with the, cl the classes you attended each week so that we can keep track of that and then submit it to either SAF or ISA. So please keep us posted on that so that we can make sure you get your continuing education credit if you're interested. And then finally, um, especially for those of you who are presenting today and those who are not, we would love to highlight your projects as adaptation demonstrations. And there's multiple platforms that we can be doing this on, whether it's through the NIACS adaptation framework um, and on our website forestadaptation.org as a demonstration project or through the Southwest Climate Hub or potentially through PyCask and Heather's team as well. So please uh, let us know if you are interested in pursuing this as an option after this course is over because we would love to highlight all of the amazing work you're doing and the things that you've been thinking about when you're talking about climate adaptation for your projects in the areas where you live and work. So please let us know if this is something you're interested in because we would love to highlight your projects. And so with that, I'll just see if there's any questions. And if not, what we'll do is we will transition now to your presentations. And I think we've seen six different groups sign up to present today. So we've got a list based on that sign up form and that's the order that we'll go in. And so Andy, we'll start with you and your presentation. And the other thing that I'd ask is I'm gonna leave the recording on for this so that there's a couple of people who are on spring break with their kids this week who would love to see these presentations but who couldn't attend today. But if you would prefer for your presentation to not be recorded, please let me know so that we can make sure we turn the recording off. And I think that's it. So this is the order for the presentations. If you did not have a chance to sign up, um, please let us know and we'll make sure we add you to this list. But we're going to start with Andy and then the Puavava team, KLC, Koho Alawe, um, the Kamehameha schools, and then Yumi's team. So if there's anyone I'm missing from this list, please send us a chat and we'll make sure we get you all lined up to present. Yeah, Courtney. Um... Uh, this is Christian. We're not we're not missing anybody for presentation, but we are missing something important. I just wanted to uh, extend a very happy birthday to Ryan today. Who um, he's uh, he's sharing uh, part of his birthday with us. So let's uh, all wish Ryan a happy birthday in the chat box. Awesome! Thank you for letting us know that, Christian. And happy birthday, Ryan! How exciting! Thank you. Courtney, I had a couple slides. Did, did they not make it into the deck here? They or are. They I was, yep, they're here. I was hoping we could do that as 
kind of next steps and where are we going from here? Does that still okay. work for you? That's or fine. Would you yeah. rather no, no, that's fine. I just, yeah, that's great. Okay. And thanks for the birthday wish. Sounds great. Awesome. So I'll stop sharing and Andy, you should be able to share your screen. Um, some other things too is we, since we do have six presentations, we would like to try to keep this, our presentations to five minutes per group. So um, either Maddie or I will jump in if you're going a little long and let you know. So please do try to keep your presentation to five minutes. All right, it says I'm screen sharing. We're see on. see it, but I else. Yes, it looks good. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing nodding. Now I just need to make sure that I can actually play this baby. Okay, we are Gil Evelands, LC, a family owned company. And our mission with the property, which we acquired in 2009 from Campbell Estate is to restore the native ecosystem. The property I have circled on the top map shows you roughly where we are in the uh, leeward Oahu. And then the map below it, the green splotch is our, uh, our property, uh, which goes coastline up the top of Mauna Kapu. Now, we were asked for this project to just to pick part of the property. So I picked a, um, a shallow gulch at the far western end of our agricultural lands. The property is, uh, the lower part is in agriculture and the upper part is all in conservation. So I picked Piliokahe Gulch because it does have some uh, Iliahi there already and um, is a bit of a more shallow swale in some of our gulches and therefore has a little bit of soil. But it's currently in cattle ranching and we would like to transition, of course, from the cattle ranching to native dryland forest somehow. Um, <laughs> not sure exactly how we're going to do that, but that was part, part of the class. Alrighty, I need to go to a different view. I can navigate without the slides. Um, I took a look at the profile uh, portfolio that Ryan put together for me, and uh, it pretty much confirmed what we knew. We've got a hot and dry challenging area to plant, and in the future it will be hotter and drier and more challenging, but no huge surprises in, in terms of what climate change is going to bring. Uh, and every year is a little bit different. And, um, but it, it is noted, notable that we've had uh, over 2,000 drought events at the site, according to Ryan's portfolio, and four since we acquired it just barely more than a decade ago, which is uh, a little intimidating. Um, we know we already have problems with hydrophobic soils, and uh, that was made clear again in the portfolio. You got hotter and drier weather, the, the soil's going to be even more strong. And probably our number one concern in the area, uh, our challenge to everything, is, is wildfires. We, there's a history of fires through the property. And since we bought it in 2009, there was a pretty nasty fire uh, that uh, swept up through Nanakuli that many of you are familiar with that uh, uh, endangered a lot of the plants on the Nanakuli poly. And um, that also came onto our, our property. So looking at that wildfire, uh, it, this is in the gulch, the photos that I'm showing that um, brown spot uh, slope there was our exclosure that contained our Iliahi. Um, the fire was kept away from it in the ag lands because of the grazing. As you can see, there's some rangeland that isn't scorched there. But it was sneaky. It went up 
slope and came down through our conservation land where we did not yet have a fire, but have any grazing and it burned right through our Iliahi grove. Um, the good news is in the bottom photo, four months later, a lot of the trees were re-sprouting either from the root or the branches, so we didn't lose everything. But that made it clear to us on the management team that uh, fire control has got to be our first and primary focus. And we have since completed rather a good network of fire access roads uh, and uh, acquired some uh, all-terrain vehicles so we can get out there instead of physically lugging jerry jars to try to put out stumps. Uh, right now in this um, gulch, we are uh, using Yumi's crew to help uh, control some of the invasives that came in after the fire. A clue is, was, is a nasty, thorny thing, which seemed to really like the situation. And um, we're, you know, we're, we're trying, to, trying to keep the, uh, the invasives down. But we've got some long-term unanswered questions that I've got some hints at from this course, but uh, don't, don't really have answers to. And that's, you know, what do we do about this cattle? We need them right now, but in the long term, what can we do instead? And we're really working on the soil health ends. Um, I've broadly known all throughout the conservation community, we need huge banks to uh, go out, revegetate after a fire. I mean, tell me where you can get a million alii seeds and I'd be very happy. Uh, and in this area here, we have the capability of running irrigation lines to it from our uh, water supply, which is essentially the board of water supply through our private system. But is that really something that is sustainable in the long term? It's what we have planned in the short midterm. So I, I have to say in this course, it pretty much confirmed that what we thought was a situation is the situation. And most of our tactics are uh, are unchanged, but we realize that it's going to be more challenging moving on. We, to keep the uh, fire down, we got to keep the guinea grass down. Right now, that's with cattle. We're building our fire breaks and like to explore fuel breaks. Uh, still wondering how really to improve the the soils in each section. But on the short term, a shorter term, we'll probably work with more closures, keep the cattle in, uh, fence a little more areas uh, to protect the natives and build on the species can survive there now, the ahi and a few of the more common ground cover and, and shrubs. But it is among the more challenging sites we have on our property. Uh, I didn't show you the nice moisture ones where things actually grow. <laughs> but I appreciate the opportunity to meet up with all of you and to learn from all of you. And if you ever are on Oahu and want to see what we're doing, give me a shout. And um, thanks also, Ryan and Chris and Christian for your help offline and look forward to working with you. I'm going to stop sharing and you can pass it off to the next. Fantastic, mahalo Andy for that great presentation. Um, I'd love to take just a couple of minutes and see if there's any questions from the group for Andy. This is Heather, I'll ask a question. Um, I just wondered, perhaps you've addressed this throughout the course, so I apologize, but with all of that, work that you're focusing on and prioritizing, like what is your main mechanism for, for being able to do that in terms of like um, partnerships or funding, or do you now have a plan that you can't implement um, or can you implement it? Okay, um, we're moving forward uh, as best we can. We we're mostly privately funded, we're self-funded. The property has income from other things. Let's see if I move on the side here, you can see some communication towers behind my head. Those tenants are our main source of income. And although we have a number of things we spend money on, 
conservation restoration is our mission and we are trying to move forward on that. So far we have not formed a, a, a matching funding partnership, uh, uh, although we are certainly aware of them and, and have started developing plans to do that. We have active uh, relationships with the Waianae Mountain Watershed Partnership, Yumi's group, which is doing some work for us and hopefully we'll do some more. And the Malama Learning Center, which as a 501c3 has the opportunity to get funding that is not available to uh, our LLC, which is not a nonprofit. Um, we've taken a major step just as of March 1st, we have hired a conservation manager. Uh, before that, it was kind of one of my brothers and me doing it part time and I'm in Hilo. So yeah, and we rely a lot on volunteer networks. We have our roots in uh, the Sierra Club and some exceedingly hardworking volunteers who have essentially adopted little pockets of our property. And um, our strategy has been kind of to let them run loose and see what they come up with that works. Uh, and uh, we're learning rather a lot <laughs> from their enthusiasm. They come up uh, sometimes a couple times a week to Malama, their little bits of, uh, of, of, of garden or, or out planting. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on kind of small scale. I, I get the feeling, you know, we're kind of at a, a slow simmer and hopefully as we get our conservation managers feet on the ground, uh, it'll accelerate. I don't know if that answered your question, Heather, but we, uh, we're not reliant currently on grant funding, but we, um, are trying to make the best of the partnerships that we do have available. Yeah, no, that that answered it perfectly. Thank you. Yeah, good to know. Good luck. That was a great presentation. <laughs> Excellent. Are there any other questions for Andy before we move on? And I did see that Ryan posted a link to a successful dryland forest restoration project in the chat. So. Um, it's a great resource to check out as well. Yeah, one, one point I wanted to make about that is, um, and I think Andrea probably is maybe tapping into this through Yumi, but you know, getting the, the volunteers up there, like the Kupu organization that brings student volunteers up, up into the, th you probably know about them. And what I think is interesting about the Oahe project is they have a kind of a grassroots uh, volunteer project where people from the community sign up and they, they drive them up there and, and they do, they do the good work. And I think that, uh, and I was talking to Christina um, Alvaros on, on this and she, we were talking about just how, how do you start something like that? You know, how do you get that community involvement and get those people interested? And I don't know if but there might be a good resource to reach out to if you're interested in trying to mobilize something like that. We do have a list of volunteers just uh, that we've started and we're going to expand it. I'm really quite aware of uh, Oahe and uh, quite jealous of them. I, I'm personal friends with uh, Otto Medeiros and, and have just watched their work with Envy uh, over the past couple of decades. Uh, and um, yeah, they've, they've got a similar situation coming in a rangeland and having to fence it off and, and bring back a native ecosystem. Um, but uh, we, hope to be able to remobilize our volunteers. We've had a number of events uh, depending on what we're doing, but the fence around our uh, kupu exposure, which is part of the uh, Oahu Elipayo habitat was built entirely with volunteers and some uh, technical help from Yumi's crew. Uh, and we just spent a bunch of weekends putting in the fence and that's kind of the benefit of coming out of the Hawaii service trip program at the Sierra Club, because that's what I did in my misguided youth is build fences and, <laughs> and trails and it's uh, showing up well now. We also have uh, had a small project with Dr. Camila Mora, who seems to be able to snap his fingers and get 50 people in two hours. Uh, it's kind of like, <laughs> but, um, Yes, uh, we work a lot with volunteers. It's not as well coordinated as Oahe yet, but I'm hoping that will change now that we have a staff member to do it. But I've got about 120 
people in our, in our volunteer Google group, not all of whom show up or have ever shown up, but at least they said they were interested. We rely a lot on volunteers. Uh, anyway. That's great. Mahalo, Andy, for all of your present your presentation was fantastic and thanks for setting the stage for us as we keep going. So now I'm gonna hand it off to David, who I believe is presenting for the Pua Va Va group. Right on. Thank you, Courtney. Just gonna share my screen and jump into it. <clears throat> Aloha, everybody. So yeah, I'm I'm with the Pu'u Va'a group, and um, yeah, we got. Let me just here, huh? <laughs> so yeah, our project site is um, Pu'u Va'a Va'a the cone over here, um, and we kind of got a couple of different things going on for us. We, um, right now, it's pretty exciting because we have the, the new community-based subsistence forestry area unit, which is about an 84-acre um, area on the unit, kind of right in this area. And then um, Napu Natural Resource Management is the, the state program, that state-funded program that um, kind of just manages the whole Ahu Pua'a. Um, and then one other project is the UH Manager Climate Climate Change Corps program, which is a graduate program that I'm actually going to be entering, or I'm pretty much in it already, but I'm going to be going back to school for that. Um, trying to look at things to prevent or to prepare for climate change, and a big reason why um, Elliot Parsons suggested that I um, attend it. Yeah, so this is our site, Pu'u Va'a um, It's about 488 acres. And um, as you can see from the, the map, it has a lot of grassland on the backside, this beautiful picture, um, courtesy of Andrew Hara, who just came actually last week. Um, he got this beautiful picture from the front. And you can see it's pretty well forested in the front. Um, it's actually an existing unit, but um, there's a lot of grassland. Um, a lot of community members and like visitors are like come to hike. Um, it's the oldest geological feature on Hualalai at about 100,000 years old or so. Um, it also used to be the most botanically diverse. Um, and yeah, Puava in general is the most botanically diverse place in Hawaii previously. Um, but of course now it's highly degraded um, forest at least, and now it's been converted to pasture lands, most of it. Um, so where our kind of main goal is to um, revert a lot of the pasture lands back to these forested ecosystems shown. You know, our ecological, everything, you know, ecological. <laughs> um, so, so some of our impacts that kind of, there's a lot of, that we kind of focus on. The big ones for us was drought. Um, and with that, you know, the increased temperatures, humidity, um, a lot of fires obviously closely related to the drought. So a lot more likelihood of wildfires and that's already an issue for us. Um, a lot of uh, Apu'u is um, ikuyu grass, which during drought um, can be very dry and flammable. Like right now it's all green and beautiful, but drought will definitely make that a lot more of a fire hazard. Um, invasive species, always a big one for us. We have a lot on the Pu'u in particular. Um, we have castor bean, we have the kikuyu grass is pretty invasive in itself. Um, 
indigo and a bunch of other stuff. Um, yeah, and then some other kind of things that climate change might affect that we think are going to be like uh, potentially like lower seed production and viability, um, which is related to like potentially reduced pollinators visiting the plants. And that's already an issue for us with the degraded forests. You know, we don't have as much niches for our native insects and birds as there once was. So seed dispersal and stuff is just going to be even more um, affected. Um, some opportunities potentially, um, the, the dieback of kikuyu grass could make planting easier. Um, it would have to be <laughs> pretty, we have to be pretty fast, like after any droughts because the weed species will come in. Um, <laughs> so that's it's definitely something and have to be planned well. Um, there's a, I know Elliot mentioned this from the last drought we had, um, he noticed that a lot of the pests were not even there due to the drought. Um, I guess I'm sure they need a certain amount of water and you know, the droughts and lack or higher temperatures, maybe just it's not suitable for pests. So maybe the plants will benefit from that, having those um, lack of pests. And then also, you know, wildfires are bad, but you know, if, if you can jump into the disturbed area and plant right after that, um, you can use that as an opportunity. And then I think the picture is kind of covering it, but um, grass kind of dies back and you can see the landscape a lot easier. So potentially seeing agriculture or archaeological features, as well as um, just being able to traverse the landscape a little bit easier um, when the grass is died back. It's always an opportunity. And then, so some of our actions that we kind of thought the most key ones is just installing more um, water catchment and storage on the pool. So that during drought times, we can keep our plants alive because I know we have a pretty bad drought in 2010. And one of the things that they were doing is actually like planting during that time, I believe, because the grass is dying back. Um, and then to prevent any fires, which are already a really big issue for our dryland forests over here, and if it's going to be exaggerated, exuberated with um, climate change, having new fuel breaks, and then also potentially having like a, even like a green strip kind of thing going with like fire resistant plants around the edges, just to do whatever we can to be more res resilient to those fires. And then yeah, just seed scattering, post fires, help combat that non-native seed bank. And then also part of the project I'm supposed to be looking at is um, kind of getting the most suitable plants for climate change. And also like, also of course, restoring what was there historically. And the, the, the new community unit is a really Cool in that sense that um, we're going to be able to introduce um, more than just like what we've been doing, like natives. Like we can actually have canoe plants and um, potentially even agricultural um, significant crops that are not invasive. And I think that'll be a uh, really cool to like kind of explore that more and and see what plants are really um, drought tolerant and might do good under uh, new climate conditions. So I think those are kind of the big ones we were thinking would be good actions. And then to wrap it up, the outcomes, we kind of hope to transition the pool by fencing and 
restoring the forest, um, grassland forested areas, and then of course continuing to re reduce or eliminate as much invasives as we can. Um, also, just you know, the fire resistance with the fuel breaks and all different species, and then of course. So overall, I think all of those things, we want to create these communities that are resistant to climate change with the having as much diversity and um, especially like, you know, thinking ahead of what these what plants will do good now, but also during drought conditions. Um, and, you know, and they kind of brought this up too, um, having like a fourth aspect to the the whole resistance resilience and transition idea um a, joy, a joyful transformation because um his transition wasn't really quite fitting for for us so kind of thinking transforming the landscape into something um you know that the community and the idea is like to have a diverse regenerative community driven sanctuary so um yeah it's gonna be a lot of hopefully you know a lot of community involvement and, and it's gonna look a lot different you know in, in the next couple years and and it, it's you know joyful you know it's gonna be it's it'll be amazing to see that happen and i think if everybody you know can can help with it and it'll it'll just really be a beautiful thing yeah I think but uh yeah it's kind of our kind of our main outcomes that we hope to get um kind of in the it's a it's a big place and we have a lot of a lot of different things we're kind of juggling but um the pu'u is a, the you know it's the namesake of our ahupa'a and it's a very very special place there's not a lot of places like that so um, yeah, I think preparing, preparing for climate change is very important and yeah, I think we, this, uh, this whole workshop is really going to help, like, I think, spin the wheel and get things going, especially with all the, the new things happening up here. It's really exciting, but yeah, I think with that, if anybody has any questions for me or, um, I don't know if you guys want to ask anybody else, like Elliot or Edith guys, or have been around for a long time. But um, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure the audio works like that. But <laughs> that's great, Mahalo. Yeah, Mahalo. We have time we have for time. one question um, for David or the Puavava team. Mm. So oh, hey really? David, oh, or, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, Asa from Three Mountain Alliance, David. So yeah, we're not doing a presentation today, but um, kind of one of our things in just large storage, large scale seed storage was a lot on our list too for, you know, responding to fires, quick restoration response. And one of the issues we had and that we were kind of thinking of was just what the practicality of that was. And I wonder if you guys had any time to think about that, like actually, you know, going from saying, okay, we need to be storing all these seeds to actually getting the facilities, getting the personnel and all that stuff together to do it. Because I think that we're kind of in the same situation there where, yeah, it would be of a huge benefit, but just the, the reality of it. I don't know. Did you guys think about that at all? Yeah, the, I mean, the reality... I mean, we haven't discussed it very much, but the reality is, is it's, you know, not obviously not all species are storable. And also for us, like, honestly, just getting the seeds is just hard sometimes. Like the forest is pretty degraded and, and it's mm -hmm. just, and there's only so many staff over here and like only so much time to collect seeds. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think getting those certain seed stock plants is really important too. Like, like, 
it's in the field like i find it pretty hard like i know some places have a lot of seed but for epoa you know some species it's actually pretty hard to get seed from um i think a lot of it i mean i don't know the whole extent but a lot of it probably has to do with how uh degraded a lot of the ecosystems are to what it formerly was I mean, maybe there's not a lot of niches filled for like pollinating and stuff like that so but yeah the seed storage it's a it's great to think about but uh to actually be successful in that is another story and something yeah. to think about just for bringing that up lisa yeah no right on david good job really enjoyed it Thanks. It looks like Andy has a question. So maybe while Andy, as you're asking that, Chloe, if you'd be willing to pull up your presentation for a KLC, that would be great. It's not exactly a question, just to supplement that because we're looking at seed storage too. But our intermediate strategy is we are planting plants such as Iliahi and Ali'i close where we can keep an eye on them instead of having to go out and ranging around the property, we're trying to develop more like seed gardens so that we have uh, accessibility uh, to harvest them when, when they're ready. So that, that's just one small thing that we're trying to do. Right, yeah, that's a great, um, I think that's a great approach to, like we have a, a unit called Hawaiina that has a lot of outplanted stuff. And honestly, it, um, if you take care of them, it, the our plants do pump out a lot of seeds, so it's a good strategy. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, mahalo, David, and thanks everyone for that great discussion. I hopefully will have time to continue some of this at the end as well, but let's continue moving on so everyone has a chance to present. So again, mahalo, David and the Puavava team. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Chloe and your presentation looks like it's up and ready to go. Alrighty. Hello, everyone. My name is Chloe Martins Kili Omalu. I will be presenting today with Zachary Cook and Christian Giardina, and we will be talking about our project site located in Laupahoehoe, Hawaii, and it is Kahikina Learning Center. Hi, everyone. Um, and so, as Chloe said, we are located um, at the Kahikina Learning Center. Uh, this is in Lapahoehoe, Hawaii on the big island and our project area is just a couple miles below the um, Lapahoehoe unit of the Hawaii Experimental Tropical Forest. Um, so our project area is about 58 acres um, and we have created this map here that kind of outlines um, how it's proportioned out in its current state. So as you can see, most of our property area as it uh, stands right now is grassland. So it's about 70% of it. Um, there are three streams that run through our property, um, and those streams in the associated like riparian habitat make up about another 20% of the property area. Um, about 1% is uh, Ohia Common Garden, so we have about 300 Ohia trees growing there, um, and so that's kind of a starting point for our project in terms of like native forest restoration. Um, and then the remainder of our property is, is just developed land, so housing and, and roads and stuff like that. And so kind of just as a brief overview of our project, we have a few key um, objectives and uh, goals. So um, for our adaptation plan, we really want to emphasize promoting the growth of native plant species on our property, um, establishing a native dominated forest ecosystem, um, and then decreasing non-native invasive species cover by more than 50% in the next 25 years. Um, and in addition to all this, we want to utilize agroforestry practices to promote the establishment of an ecosystem that in addition to ecological importance and climate adaptation resilience um, also supports socially and culturally productive outputs um, from this property area um, far into the future. Um, and I'll, I'll pass it to Chloe to talk about the specifics of these. Okay, so identifying our project goals, we, um, the first one is invasive species management. So as you've seen on our map, um, a huge portion of our property is made up of 
uh, non-native grasslands. So we hope to reduce that population as well as kahili ginger and strawberry guava. And this is actually our greatest climate impact um, at this time. And if we continue at um, the state that it's in, invasive, invasive plants will continue to outcompete um, our native populations. Uh, the second goal is to increase native plant populations through, uh, like Zach mentioned, agroforestry. So we do have uh, existing plant populations and they have been somewhat identified and we also hope to plant or create new native or non-invasive plant populations. Uh, the third one is carbon management and water quality. Uh, the first two are highlighted because we found that they're probably more important and the following two can probably be addressed by the first two. So to meet our goals, we will plant native canopy trees like Ohia or Anko and install fences along um, riparian or st stream corridors to prevent ungulate um, degradation and uh, continue to manage areas covered in non-native grasses. Uh, the next slide is our vulnerability and feasibility. Because of our project's location, we expect to see warmer conditions with an increase, increase in flood disturbances. And going back to our two goals, invasive species management and increased native populations, um, we hope to, um, we, looking back at our vulnerability, we, uh, ranked it at a moderate to high level of vulnerability. And that's just because our large presence of non-native invasive species and fragmentation. So looking at um, the grasses mainly, uh, we have guinea and cane grass and elephant grass, and they actually thrive in warmer, drier conditions. So with our new climate change, if it were to get to that point, um, they'll actually do a lot better and outcompete the native plants at a higher rate. Um, next, um, I'll touch up on the kahili ginger and strawberry real quick. Um, they'll actually do worse in our predicted uh, climate change because they actually need water. So that's a good thing. Um, Next is the increase in native plant populations. Uh, we, unfortunately, they won't do as well, depending on when we're able to get them into the ground. They might not do as well um, with adapting to the climate change, especially if they're still fresh or in the seedling phase. So hopefully the sooner we can get them into the ground or manage our grasslands a little bit better, uh, things we'll be able to uh, end into the new changes. And lastly, we ranked our feasibility low to moderate, and that's because um, manpower is a big issue and time for people to go out is a big issue. And of course, funding to get the manpower out there is minimal. And with that, I'd like to say sorry for the lack of pictures, but if anyone has any questions, you can ask them now. Thank you. Mahalo, Chloe and Zach. Does anyone have questions for the KLC team? there aren't any questions, I guess my question is, do you think your actions fall more along the resistance, resilience, or transition end of the, the spectrum or the joyful transformation? I liked that one a lot. Uh, 
Um, I think it kind of, um, when we had talked about it a couple of weeks ago in our meeting, I think we kind of had agreed that it kind of falls as a mix of, of all three. So definitely in the beginning stages, um, transition, and then more into um, resilient. It's kind of hard to achieve uh, resistance in the current state because um, as Chloe mentioned, um, our property area is fragmented from the like forest and it's surrounded by a lot of invasive species. So it's hard to become resistant to the impacts of climate change when you're you know, completely surrounded by things that exacerbate the impacts of climate change, but um, definitely transition and resilience. Awesome, thank you. Well, mahalo Chloe and Zach. And now we're gonna pass it off to the Koho Alave team. And I believe um, Kule and uh, Kalu are presenting. Mahalo. Can you folks see my screen okay? Yeah. It looks great. Okay, I can't see folks, but I don't trust, okay. Uh, aloha kakahiaka everyone. So uh, we're presenting uh, as part of the Project Kaho'olawe Ohana. And our project's main goal is to restore native habitat and promote native species recruitment uh, to our project area, which is located on the Hakioava upland side or Moka side and in the Kaulana area on Kaho'olawe. And these are more the north facing area. If you're looking from Maui, you'd, you would be able to see this part. Um, and the our Plan or ways to do this would be through outplanting, erosion control, and cultural stewardship. And this project area is really special because it actually is an extreme drought location and uh, decreases in rain and um, could cause loss of vegetation. And um, it has so many issues where there are non native plants out competing. And this is, could be amplified by climate change. And while we're still looking at the data to support our hypothesis, we've had uh, many conversations with uh, Ryan about it. <clears throat> Happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> we're really going off of a uh, cultural knowledge at, which says that the rain follows the forest area. And because Kaho'olawe has been deforested so heavily, um, we want to try and restore a small project area and um, just so we're, that's what we're going off of. And so, although the data maybe doesn't support it right now, um, we're, so, we're looking towards that and uh, having faith in the cultural knowledge that um, if we can restore a forest area on Kaho'olawe, then it will hopefully attract uh, rains that can uh, mi be, mitigate our climate change. And we also strategically chose our project area because it is already being um, managed by the Kaho'olawe Island Reserve Commission, which is the division of the state charged with managing and restoring Kaho'olawe. So we want to build on their efforts and our organization is primarily powered by volunteers and we have the ability to bring volunteers and really uh, just increase the amount of work that Kirk has started in this area. Um, to expedite the time it would take to reforest and accomplish the outplanting. So that's our major goal. I'll pass it on to Kule now. Mahalo. So to talk about some impacts, uh, our area experienced longer drought seasons. Our area is already in an extreme drought location and a decrease in rain could cause further loss of vegetation and increased erosion, et cetera. Uh, we're also at a wildfire virus. There was a wildfire that broke out last year that affected many acres of our project um, areas. Wildfire is expected to increase in Hawaii and this could further increase uh, by drought conditions. Also non-native and invasive plants. Many of the non-native plants in our project area outcompete the native plants, which causes them to, um, to, to die. Uh, and also extreme, persi extreme precipitation. Koholave endures a lot of negative impacts from major erosion and large rain events. Uh, continue to significantly erode what is left of Koholave soil, making it more difficult to replant, causing further disruption in the areas and our trails, um, and also our below, um, including our pristine coastal environment. Upper challenges and opportunities. Higher temperatures could could uh, increase the fire risk, which could lead to new planting opportunity on the island once the, the fire is um, completed. 
uh, El Nino. El Nino can lead to softer rain on Ko'olawe and could transform the island's ability to host uh, native plants with a softer rain. Significant runoff. With a significant runoff in the hard pan areas in the, in the gulches on the island, um, there are dams that, are currently, that currently exist, but it's difficult to maintain across the entire island. With the Koho'olawe's Island Reserve Commission's small team, again, it's, with a small team, it's harder to uh, maintain. Our project will help build more erosion control to mitigate the flash flood from heavy rain events that could damage the project area, Makai of that area. Uh, we have an opportunity to contribute our volunteer base to help uh, the Kirk monitor and enhance, enhance these dams. Uh, Kilo, which is really important, Kilo um, in observation um, can strengthen the protect Koalave's ability to observe changes over time um, and the right action to correct these needed areas. And then if we look at the, ac the adaptation actions, we are taking a hard look at these efforts for joint actions between uh, Ko'olawe Island Reserve Commission and the Protect Ko'olawe Ohana. There is potential to, to better synchronize and synergize our volunteer efforts uh, with the Kirks um, and the trajectory uh, we are heading, um, but it's not been done before in the planned ways. So we wanna be able to, to um, get that going. Uh, we also want, uh, we are also making kilo observations and, ceremon and ceremonial practices uh, that help facilitate the connection with individuals and the surrounding areas on Koalave to the core principles of our adaptation plan. This will ground our decision um, in culture and 100 years of knowledge Ike, generated by Native Hawaiians of Koholawe and ensure that, we, that they are appropriate for Koholawe. Uh, one that we're also really excited about is full-time residency program, uh, which would be a huge step um, and because the potential to uh, alleviate work the, PK, the PKO does and elevate it, sorry, to elevate the work that PKO does by having a constant presence to maintain projects on the area, volunteers who come for a short amount of time can do the most work with the preparation that the residents have um, in the area. So the residents can prepare um, exactly what the work that needs to be done. Um, and so even though the volunteers are there for a short amount of time, it can really increase um, the most work that they can do while they're there with the preparation that the residents could have. And then I'll let Ka'ulu share our outcomes. So our two major outcomes that we hope uh, from this project are to expand the resilient native plant community, um, which in turn will help to mitigate uh, the disruptions that will be caused by climate change. And then the second one is to increase human presence. And that's because, um, you know, it's a really strong Hawaiian philosophy that uh, people are meant to work um, in harmony, I guess, with the environment. So it's not that we um, need to leave Kaho'olawe alone because humans have caused so much dis disturbance and um, degraded the island that it's really up to us to restore it now. And so we believe that with increased human presence on there, it will just help, it will help to um, just increase and expedite efforts that need like dire efforts that need to be done there. And so that's what we're hoping. And we have been working on plans to um, actually, oh, I don't know what's happening, but we've been working on plans to actually uh, look at a program. And so looking at spreadsheets, how much it would cost, what would be required, all the technical aspects. So we started um, doing that and we're really excited to present it to our organization. Um, and it's really, we're really grateful to this workshop, which has got us to think deeply and um, seriously at uh, what we need to do and how we can accomplish it. So mahalo to all of you folks and mahalo to all of our fellow um, workshop people, peeps, because um, you folks also gave us a lot of great feedback and we're able to learn from what you folks are doing also. So mahalo everyone. Mahalo. Mahalo for that fantastic presentation. Are there any questions for the um, Koholawe team? Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, so first, just a comment. I mean, really, I, I, I had a, the privilege of spending a lot of time with the Kaolave team in the workshop. So I really 
got to understand what they were doing and they were you know meeting outside of the workshop on Sunday mornings pretty early from what I understand, which was I thought pretty impressive uh, taking it to that level. Um, but uh, I just wanted to commend them on that effort and coming into this and uh, and I, I appreciate everybody being here for sure, but um, just the whole idea of coming in and uh, really digging in and trying to come out of this with a, a potentially a proposal or something to get funding. I just thought that was you know, really a, a superior effort. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the reforestation, I just wanted to make a point that, um, you know, we had talked about how, you know, it, the science might not support, you know, reforesting area bringing the rains, but it, it could happen for sure. I just had recommended you guys to focus and you, na you named them, but in terms of a funder, it depends on where your funding comes from. Focus on the, the things that you are almost guaranteed that are going to happen, like all the things you mentioned, the erosion control and the fire suppression and, you um, maybe enhancing the microclimate. And, uh, you know, it really, like I said, depends on the funder because you can support all that stuff with the science. And then, you know, at the end of the day, we also hope that the rains come too as a result of, of greening up the island and, and doing those things. So, um, but again, yeah, great job guys, thanks. Any other questions? And if, yeah, go ahead, Melissa. And while she, Melissa's asking her question, Namaka and Natalie, if you want to get your presentation ready, that would be great. Yeah, thank you so much to the Olave group. I think that there's a lot of interest from the group about the residency program. And for me, I'm curious about what do you see as like a major, like if like a key thing to identify and get over or like a like a hoop you need to jump through that is going to really allow that to happen. We've had a lot of discussions um, about that and definite our workbook reflects that because a lot of it is, um, uh, had, I guess is determined by a political will and all of that because um, Koholava does have an interesting relationship because the state does have um, a stake in the island. They have the commission um, which does most of the restoration efforts and we have a lot of restrictions um, there are no commercial uses that can be um, done on the island um, access is very restricted um, because of the UXO or the unexploded ordinance that is still present there um, and so access is limited and um, and it also costs a lot more it's not like you can just drive to Koholave you have to take a boat you have to plan all of your meals out and uh, so it's a lot of extra things but it really is like the political will and how much support we can get um, to maybe find workarounds that legal workarounds and then um, having uh, the support from our volunteer base to actually make that happen. Thank you. Mahalo again, Kohalav Ehui. That was fantastic. And I look forward to hearing more about how your residency program comes along moving forward. Um, with that, let's pass it on to Natalie and Namaka, and they're going to present on the Kameha Meha schools. Hello, my Kako. Um, I'm Natalie. Uh, we work for Kameha schools on our Pu'ulehua land. Ahupua'a of Keohotu in Malka Kona, Hawaii Island. Over to Noah. Hey, Natalie, we can't hear you very well. I don't know if you can fix your audio by, by the time it's your next slide, but you're coming in and out. Sorry, guys. Okay, um, so Pu'ulehua, um, it's, a, it's a system of pu'u, um, which are cinder cones, volcanic cinder cones, and um, uh they this area is um is adjacent to the largest remaining Iliahi Mamane Nile forest in, in Hawaii, um eleven thousand acres of which we co-manage with the Three Mountain Alliance. Um it's also adjacent to areas that are being managed for Iliahi silviculture and, and harvest. Um this particular area was grazed. Um, for well over 150 years, and it's now dominated mostly by uh, non-native grasses, mostly kikuyu grass, about 375 acres in size, um, currently fenced 
um, for sheep, um, but not for pigs. And one really interesting thing we learned from Ryan when he did our portfolio was that the mean monthly rainfall for this area varies by only 2.1 inches um, across the year. And that's something that, that's, that's pretty unique um, across the Hawaiian Islands. Our goals for the area are, are similar to, you know, to, to most folks' resource management goals, to remove the ungulate, to press weeds, reduce fire risk, um, increase natives. And um, even though this is a really remote area, we feel it's also important to have um, meaningful community engagement. Oh, and one thing I forgot, one thing that, that, that really makes this area unique is um, for our land holdings is it's the only cinder it's surrounded by pahoi hoi and a'a. So um, it, it's a much more conducive environment for, for planting. Um, that also means it's more conducive to the growth of invasive species. Um, and then because it sits up so high um, above the surrounding area, um, there's a lot more exposure, you know, both more exposure to, you know, to like the drying of the sun, um, to the drying of the wind, but also to um, to cloud moisture and that sort of thing. So it, it, it's, it's unique. Okay, back to Natalie. In the meeting, this meeting. Okay, I switched to my phone, so hopefully you guys can hear me now. Um, so we have, a, there's a number of climate change impacts um, that are going to um, impact this area. However, the Probably the biggest three are increases in temperature, which a lot of you shared as well. And being a high elevation area, we know that um, temperatures are going to rise more rapidly here. Um, there's also predicted increase in frequency and intensity of drought, which we've already been experiencing. And in Kona, it's really interesting because this is exacerbated by volcanic activity. So when there is bog present in our air in Kona, which um, happens when the volcano is erupting, which is now, um, the more moisture um, is kind of stuck in those bog particles. And so we have less rainfall. Um, and so we have intense drought and then that is exacerbated um, by this fog presence. And then um, increase in wildfire risk uh, in our climate portfolio that Ryan shared with us, our dry seasons are gonna get drier, wet seasons are gonna get wetter. And that means that um, during the wet season, a lot of our invasive grasses uh, have time to bloom and then die back uh, substantially in the dry, dry season, which um, provides more fuel for, for wildfires. And in um, Pu'ulehua, it's actually interesting because um, it's known, this area is known to be a high lightning strike area. Um, and there's also a nearby subdivision um, that has been growing in population. And so there's uh, really, um, a chance for increased ignition um, into the future. And there we came up with a lot of challenges and opportunities as well in the workbook. Um, these are just some of them listed, you know, basically some of our business as usual um, techniques are gonna become more difficult. For example, herbicides are not gonna be effective during um, periods of extreme drought or outplanting seasons and strategies may not work um, in the same places or as well into the future. Um, uh, if there's enough rise in air temperature, even malaria can get introduced to the area and so it wouldn't be a refuge for our native forest birds as it is now. Um, and then there were some questionable, par perhaps uh, possible opportunities that if like similar to Puawa, what Puawa was sharing, um, you know, if there is enough drought, there could be a good reduction in fuel loads um, of those invasive grasses, and so maybe less fire risk. Um, and uh, we are thinking maybe some dry conditions would limit the spread of rapid ohia death um, because it is a fungus and and does travel or could travel more through moisture. Um, yeah, and then like one more I'll just share quickly is that. Um, in, in, in not under all of these climate changes, it kind of creates unsafe conditions for community engagement. Um, so it might become even more difficult to bring uh, students or community groups to this area, more difficult than it already is. Hand it back to Namaka. We listed 40 adaptation tactics. 
um, it was kind of hard to choose which ones I wanted to share with you guys. But, you know, a lot of them are things that are, that are, that are you know, just business as usual, um, you know, like, like fencing and completely excluding ungulates. So they're things that we already plan to do. So some, some things we wanted to highlight, um, one was developing a network um, with adjacent landowners who have shared stewardship goals. Um, we have really good relationships with most of our neighbors, but they don't all get along with each other. Um, and if, if we're going to be successful at, um, at, 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 you know, restoring the forest on a landscape scale, it needs, you know, a lot more than just command of schools. Um, and, you know, there's so much uh, value to be able to, you know, you know, sharing seeds with your neighbors, sharing um, techniques, um, shared facilities, all those kinds of things that, that that's something that we'd like to, to, to do to do more um, or to try to develop. Um, another is to protect uh, the craters within Pu'ulehua. I think there's, there's three craters um, as refugia for rare species. In times of extreme drought, the Crater, the craters seem to be able to hold um, more moisture than the surrounding area. And so, you know, we see uh, more large trees there. Um, there's actually some pockets um, of, of rare species that are still present in the craters. And so um, this might mean things like during, during you know, sensitive times, maybe during an extreme drought time, we, we completely limit access to the craters. Um, you know, we, we focus restoration efforts there, that, that sort of thing. Um, bring rare species that aren't present there, that are present in the surrounding landscape to the crater um, as, as protection. And then I think the most intriguing for us was, um, was a lot of the tactics around outplanting, you know, how we can improve our outplanting going forward, doing things like, you know, planting more future adapted species, collecting seeds from areas that are drier, um, planting things that have a large, you know, have a wider ecological amplitude, you know, can, can, can thrive and survive in, um, you know, in, in, in varied conditions, um, experimenting with, you know, with, uh, with, you know, new mixes of species, planting um, different age classes into, into areas. Um, and then also, like, like, like others have said, um, you know, developing the capacity to be more nimble to react to times of disturbance. Um, so having that store of of seeds or available outplants. So when there's a fire, um, you know, we can immediately, you know, come to the area and 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 and, and direct seed, or um, or being prepared after a drought, you know, as soon as it rains, to be able to come in and outplant and to take advantage of um, of those kinds of opportunities that that are provided. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Go ahead, Natalie. <laughs> and so um, the outcomes that we really hope for this project, um, you know, we had we had numerous objectives, but I think it can we think it can be distilled down to you know these three basic things. Like we want to increase native species abundance, cover, and diversity of plants and and animals. We want to decrease invasive species cover. And overall, we want to ensure the socio-ecological resilience of the broader Iliahi-dominated forest. And, um, you know, recognizing that it's the health of our forest is dependent on the health of our people, and the health of our people is dependent on the health of our forest. And um, the relationships that people have um, to Iliahi and an Iliahi-dominated forest is, is just as important as the health of the forest itself. Um, yeah. So, if, I don't know if you guys have any questions, but mahalo kako. Mahalo, Natalie and Namaka. That was a fantastic presentation. Does anyone have questions? You blew us all away with your 40 different adaptation tactics. So we all don't know what to ask, <laughs> but I, I have a question. Go ahead, Ryan. I'm just curious. Um, I thought that was really a cool idea to have, like you said, to have everything, you know, uh, said nimble, be nimble for, for adaptation. And, um, and I guess having the plants is, is one part of that, but then 
you know, having a place to keep the plants. And I mean, it sounds like a lot to mobilize to do that. Do you have the infrastructure and kind of to, to set something up like that? Or is that a whole nother project to develop that to be ready for the, the servants? We do not have the infrastructure for that. Um, I think that's the challenge, you know, for for you know for a lot of us is is you know we definitely we want to to be able to be more nimble, but it it it's so um, it's so expensive um, and it takes a lot of time. And um, I, I think there's 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 some really great partnering that could potentially happen if if enough of us get together. You know, some some you know an idea I've had for a long time. That um, that I think could work if if enough of us got on board is um, you know to to have like a NRCS style plant materials center on each island that could mass produce native seeds using agricultural techniques kind of like um, the Ho'olehua plant materials center did for Koho'olawe years ago. It's an expensive thing to do, but it's also expensive to have your your crew go out and collect seeds um, by hand. And um, I, I definitely think it's something that's possible. Um, maybe we could even find some funding to do that on a, on a larger scale, and that could benefit, you know, restoration projects across across the state. Um, so, so no, we don't, but uh, but we have, we have ideas. <laughs> that's a great idea, and I think that ties in really well with your community stewardship and shared stewardship efforts as well. I think it would be great to pursue a grant because it sounds like that's a need across all of these projects. So um, any other questions? And if not, I'm gonna hand it off to Yumi who's gonna present on the Waianae Watershed Mountain Partnership. Cool. Well, mahalo, Namaka, Natalie. Is my screen freezing? It is just, it, oh, nope, it looks good. Okay. <laughs> I tried to cram a lot of stuff on the slide, so I apologize if it looks really busy. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to start off with where we're planning to, planning a larger scale project for us in Makaha Valley. Um, so we have a little indicator in our map where that is in the mountain range that is owned by Honolulu Board of Water Supply. So it's about 62 acres that we fenced a few years ago. Um, and we're currently managing for restoration of native species in that area. It was identified by the Board of Water Supply as a priority watershed area for them. Um, two, two valleys in Waianae are a priority for them. It's Makaha and Waianae. So we are work, we're actively managing this area, but we also need to focus some efforts on erosion management and mitigation. So I just stuck these pictures in here so you can see the slope that we're working with. Waianae is a really old mountain. We're working in really steep conditions. Um, some of the areas we do need to use ropes just for safety. Uh, but a lot of times when the crew is working in our fence unit, it is a much steeper area than others that we work in. Um, so our focus for this area is restoration management, removing invasive species. At this point, um, we are working below a pocket of native forest. So we're pretty much clear cutting very tall guava and um, a very dense stand of guava to restore it back to native forest. Um, in addition to that, Board of Water Supply does want to still include the community in our restoration management. So that up, up until COVID, of course, was a major part of what we do. Um, so what we identified as some of the most challenging um, climate change impacts for us is def are definitely rising temperatures. So we have noticed a shift in our elevational zones for our native plant restoration. So those the area, the dryland forest area that we do work in, that band is slowly shrinking over time. Um, so that's uh, presenting a new challenge for us. Like, are we trying to expand a band that is slowly shrinking because of climate change? 
Um, are we losing more of that habitat a lot faster than we realize because we've been so focused on our upper Malka watershed areas and not this band of dryland forest? Um, also the rainfall patterns that has a huge impact on our survivorship and success, and success of our restoration. So all of our little kiki plants that we grow, um, you know, how well are they doing on their own? Uh, we have limited access to water in the area. We do have a few catchments set up, um, but that's for really extreme drought conditions. So we're basically not trying to plant a garden in the middle of the forest, right? It's not feasible for us to go there every day and water these plants. We wanna make sure they can make it on their own. Um, so selection of these plants is also something that's time consuming and it's basically an experiment all the time when we are out there. Um, we're also concerned about the seed production, natural regeneration and recruitment of the plants that we put out there and the existing plants. Uh, we do have bumper crops sometimes. So some years there's an awesome amount of seeds that we can collect. And some years we see much higher predation from rats or other invertebrates. So we're definitely seeing those effects when it comes to like reduced moisture, we're seeing more predation on bark and other things that the rats would normally kind of ignore during those seasons. Um, and then also creating that hydrophobic condition for the soil out there uh, does present a really big flash flood danger for us, for our crew, for our area that we work in and a lot of soil loss. So anybody that lives in Hawaii knows when it rains really hard, like. It has over the last few weeks. Um, we're definitely seeing the drier conditions long-term from the dry season impacting the permeability of our soils in this area over time. Um, and then last but not least, of course, is wildfire, but I'm not gonna go too deep into that because that's a whole another rabbit hole that we manage um, down lower in the valley. And oh, and just a little, sorry, I should go over what our pictures are in here. Um, so. The first picture on the top left hand side that is kind of what we're dealing with it's very thick huge strawberry guava in the area um, and then that's the next picture over to the right is after we clear those areas and start using the logs for erosion berms. Um, to kind of trap more soil plant on top and below it, so we are starting some of that monitoring as well, and then we've got some baby. Uh, they're just always cute. And I have this obsession with taking pictures of plants when they're first germinating. And then this is our newest nursery at Nanakuli High School. So we have uh, four nurseries now at different schools from the West Side and Mililani. Um, and those are working with the students. Unfortunately, during COVID right now, they can't come and work with us, but um, we are taking care of the plants that they started. Um, so hopefully next school year, we can go ahead and bring them back out when they're ready to be in the field. Um, and then as far as our adaptation actions, some of the tactics that we discussed are really trying to plan and have better management for drier conditions and fluctuations in precipitation. Um, we're thinking about whether we need to adapt our species selection to grow plants that are more drought tolerant, even in our higher locations like this, um, but also presenting that challenge of, are we changing the historical biodiversity of that area by doing something like that? Um, we do try to collect, we collect 100% of our plants from surrounding areas in the Waianae Mountains, if not directly from that same um, watershed area. So that kind of presents a challenge for us whenever there's drier conditions and we have limited seed stock. Uh, so we're looking at increasing the catchment systems in that area. But as I said previously, we're also very concerned about creating a weird garden environment where there should be a forest, an independent resilient forest instead. Um, we have started to install fire breaks at our lower elevations and that's just to create a buffer and buy a little more time for our first responders, our firefighters, our wildland firefighters, so that the areas up Malka here um, have less of a chance of burning. Um, and these are just a little 
Um, and then the other thing that we did, oops, sorry about that. The other thing that we did want to focus on too is that um, we are 100% grant based. And a lot of times most funders do not want to fund the monitoring and data collection portion of management. And that's extremely difficult. We do it anyway, because otherwise it still, it makes it very difficult for us for future funding purposes or you know, long-term considerations over time to show the success uh, or effectiveness of the projects that we do without collecting this kind of data, without doing photo points every time we're out there, without you know, seeing if these berms in, in the pictures in this slide, whether they're effective, are they capturing anything, measuring how much leaf litter and soil it's actually trapping, um, what kind of changes are happening below the berms, um, so that's something that we're trying to stress to our funders like Board of Water Supply, who has been um, more supportive of data collection, but they're also very concerned because it is very time consuming when they look at our hours, you know, how many hours are actually spent on implementation versus just measuring and counting things. Um, they would like it if it's effect <laughs> efficient. And sometimes that's not always the case. So you can't just like stop and take measurements while you're trying to outplant or cut down trees at the same time. Um, and then just for us, for some of our outcomes, these I had to highlight our crew because these are the guys that are on the ground working extremely hard in uh, a very challenging environment in YNI. Um, but definitely increasing our planning and preparation, developing better adaptive management strategies, having some longer term goals for the area. And that's what um, I'm really appreciating about all the exercises that we're doing because we are trying to create longer term goals for erosion management um, related to climate change for this valley and hoping that we can use that knowledge that we learn from this workshop to apply to other areas that we work in across the mountain range. Um, like I said, again, increased monitoring, in increasing that justification for that long-term data collection to show over time what kind of positive impact we're having in our um, bigger backyard. And then as well as having a successful restoration and erosion management project, transforming that degraded watershed back to a resilient native dryland forest and even increasing that footprint if possible, which we think is. Um, and just having that increased adaptability to change because I, we are definitely seeing a difference from the top of Ka'ala down to our lowest elevation work sites, management sites. There is a huge difference in um, the moisture content, the temperature, how long our dry season is, how long our wet season, how long our wet seasons are, and how all of that um, impacts our overall program. We do everything from our own seed collection and propagation to weed control to fence building to restoration work. So we see it full circle in everything that we do. And then also from this um, gaining better justification, evidentiary support for our future funding and uh, future grants um, to show that this works and how we can adapt to different climate changes and you know changes to our environment here in Hawaii and how we can apply that to real world uh, situations. And no, that's not all different willy willy seeds. That's the same willy willy seeds that I reshape into letters, but people freak out and want to know how many seeds that is and things like that. But it's the same seeds and I shape them over and over for different letters. <laughs> awesome. Mahalo, Yumi. That was a fantastic presentation as well. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions for Yumi? And I also realize we're a little bit past 1030. So if you do have to take off, go ahead and feel free to take off and mahalo everyone so much for your time. But we do have a few next steps we'd like to go over for those of you who can stay on. Um, and does anyone have questions for Yumi? I have a question, Courtney. Thanks, Ryan. One, one comment, one question. One, in terms of the monitoring and data collection, I mean, that's a, 
a critical component and then for namely so that you can prove the project was success so you then you could ask for more money to do another one um i mean that i was surprised people don't or the funders don't want that because um i have a lot of work on the international um level with the green climate fund and you need to have a whole monitoring data collection and evaluation plan into your proposal in the very beginning so i think that um you know you can always justify the need for data and um you know enlighten folks um, when they're questioning those things because of how important it is for the, the bigger picture. Uh, in terms of um, your work with the high school, I thought that was interesting and that might you know, kind of tie into you know, um, the MACA's maybe uh, problem not having that infrastructure or the place to develop those plants. And I think that yeah, working with the community and to develop those, those places where you know, people can develop these plants to create these nimble systems of getting the plants out there after the disturbance. I thought maybe you could just speak to what it's like. I, and I know from our conversations that you're very good at getting help through Kupu and high schools. And, and it seems like you're really good at that. Can you speak to what it's like working with the high schools and maybe what they're getting out of it and how you see that moving forward uh, with your adaptation work? Sure, and I'm off a long time no see. I feel like I haven't seen you in person in a long time. Um, but yeah, so if anyone has any questions on how we actually developed that program and wants to, you know, message me or have a conversation about that, a more detailed conversation about that later on too, please just go ahead and email me. Um, but really quickly, uh, what we did is we really have some dedicated teachers. So you need to have that one, at least one dedicated teacher that is willing to help us manage the program. It is almost independent in the fact that we are the ones that go in, manage it, so uh, you know, take care of the nursery, et cetera. The kids do go in and do their own sanitization and, and nursery duties, but the overall um, management of that nursery is under us. So we do uh, pay for the you know construction. Our crew is actually the, the crew that builds the shade houses. It's not that difficult. It sounds a little scary at first, but it's not. Um, so we are the ones that build those nurseries. We have developed um, just some exercises with the teachers, and that's kind of unique to what those teachers would like to teach their kids, whether it's more of a holistic, like climate change, watershed management, everything, or if they're looking just at native species, et cetera. Um, so we develop it from there. We select species that we know will have higher rate of success with students, depending on their age and skill level. Um, and then throughout the year, we take them out in the field with us to do weed control. They take care of their plants. Um, there's an extracurricular club at most of the schools that we work with. We take them out to do seed collection in different areas across the Wine and Mountain Range. So that's kind of how we've dealt with um, having to limit the amount of time we spend out in the field collecting seed because that can get that can become really expensive over, over time too. So we have lots of little hands that are helping us usually. Um, and then we also uh, have them, you know, water and take care of the plants during the regular school year and then bringing those plants back out with them at the end of the year during our wetter season. Um, and it, it is a lot of work. Um, I will say that to run one nursery, uh, depending on your staff and um, expenses in your location, um, you know, it, it can be a little daunting, but at the same time, one nursery, say Nanakuli, for example, will produce between three to 4,000 plants a year or more. Um, and some years we've had like 7,000, 10,000 plants. It just depends on the type of species that we collect for that year and how well they do at that location. And then also our nurseries, school nurseries are at different elevations. So we see success um, growing different species at these nurseries. So like Nanakuli is awesome for Milo and Ma'o, but um, Mililani is better for some of our wetter species that like a little bit higher elevation. Um, so we're, you know, kind of experimenting with that. And then we want to circle back around with all of the students that are involved in the projects so they can talk about, talk amongst themselves, kind of present to each other about their findings and their experience because they are working with slightly different species based on their location. Hope that kind of answered and I didn't ramble too much, I'm sorry.
but it's a great way because we don't have, well, also it's a great way because we also don't have massive amounts of retails, uh, space right to put all of these nurseries each nursery is a 40 by 60 shade house they're huge for us and so now instead of only having two shade houses we have six um, so it's a great way for us to use a little space um, the vice principal slash principals of those schools are super stoked about it because it's an outdoor learning classroom for them and it's enhancing their students' experiences and also opening up different career opportunities, educational opportunities for them as well. Um, so it's good justification for, let me use your space and your DOE or something. So you might have free water for us to use <laughs> as well. That's great. Mahalo Yumi for your presentation. And I'm really impressed with the long-term data collection and monitoring that you are doing, especially since you are depending on grants to fund all of it. So it is really impressive what you're already accomplishing on the ground. Thank you. Um, yeah. And mahalo to everyone who presented today. And thank you all so much for sharing your knowledge and your adaptation stories with us. And thank you everyone who has participated in this course over the last eight weeks. It's been really, really fun for us to learn from you and to hear your stories and learn more about climate change impacts and adaptation actions for Hawaii. So mahalo again so much for your time and your shared knowledge. Um, just to wrap up, there were a couple additional resources that we wanted to share. So if you're interested in continuing these conversations and staying engaged, one of the partners we would be remiss to not mention is EcoAdapt. And so they have a ton of products and processes to really start thinking about climate change impacts and vulnerabilities and also those examples of adaptation. And so some of those examples of products they've compiled are um, synthesis reports and then local vulnerability assessments and adaptation summaries, uh, different technical resource documents, and then also on cakex.org, they have compiled their list of resources for the work that they have done. So I would encourage you to connect with EcoAdapt if you have a chance as well, because they also have some fantastic products that they can offer. Um, Christian, is there anything else you wanted to mention about EcoAdapt? Um, no, I, I think that's a great summary. I, I mean, I really encourage you um, to go to CakeX, uh, even just to look at the, the more general resources that are island specific and across sectors. It's just a really rich, um, uh, source of climate related information. Awesome. Thank you. And then here we're revealing the new logo that Ryan has been working on. And so I'm going to hand it off to Ryan to talk more about the drought knowledge exchange. Great. Thank you. Yes. The, uh, I can't take all the credit for this uh, logo. I only a very small part, one third of it, Christian and Abby, um, no, definitely we had their hands on us. We had a graphic designer build this. So this is our new logo. We changed it to the from the Hawaii Drought Knowledge Exchange to the Pacific Drought Knowledge Exchange. And uh, because we'll you know eventually hopefully be scaling this up to you know go a little bit further um, west into the Pacific. But I just wanted to um, make a point that uh, we're not into our phase two um, part of this project yet. We're still on the pilot. And even though we're kind of testing the waters here with this adaptation course, many of you are hoping to work with uh, moving forward. Uh, to deepen engagement and to um, you know work on delivering you some some new products, uh, potentially some fact sheets and things like that. And uh, I just wanted to point out that with the CCBD portfolio, this is also a work in progress. Uh, right now, I'm pulling together another year of rainfall so that we can you know, see what 2020 did. Uh, that means another year of the drought analysis as well. We have some temperature maps that are coming out. We can do temperature trends, just like I did for the rainfall on different timescales. We have data now, but it doesn't go up to the present day. So um, we're gonna have gridded maps of that. So I can do that in the portfolio. There's a, a fire risk assessment um, model that's being built for to tell you what the fire risk is in your area. And then there's a, a real-time product coming out to give you real-time warnings. And that's not gonna be in the portfolio, but that's coming out within the next year. There's, there's money to do that. So I keep people posted on that. And then there's, um, another downscaling projection it, and uh, that just came out and we're gonna include that in the portfolio. So now there'll be three, three uh, scenarios to choose from. 
two of them in somewhat agreement, you know? So just to make it even more confusing for folks, we're gonna do that for you. And then uh, as Christian mentioned, there's a carbon assessment. I thought maybe we might be able to bring some of those elements into the portfolio as well. So I have everyone's email and everyone's name. So I'll probably send out a, an email like I did before and say, hey, who wants an updated portfolio? And then I can, you know, turn this around to you once we get some of these other products developed. And then again, continued engagement for our, our scaling up and uh, we're gonna have a website and we're gonna post some of these portfolios and hopefully have some tools and things that can help uh, the community understand drought better. So looking forward to uh, working with, with you folks and uh, we're really appreciative of the folks that stuck with us through this course. And those are the ones we really wanna work with moving forward, people that, um, that, are, that, are, that have bought into this process because we're, we're right along with you and um, we wanna support you the best we can. So, so thanks for that. Next slide. Oh. Okay, and then one other thing I wanted to mention is that um, uh, I've been working, you know, in, in, beyond this drought knowledge exchange, I've been working on collecting data and making data products for the last 11, 12 or so years now. And uh, something I'll probably always continue to do here in Hawaii. It's a bit of a passion at this point. And uh, we're working on developing this Hawaii climate data portal, which is gonna be basically a one-stop shop for data climate and information even uh, resources in terms of references and literature. And um, another thing that's kind of going along with that is there's an NSF pr proposal that's currently in the works and Abby Frazier is a PI on that and Tom Giambaluca is one who's, who's driving that. And uh, it's to have 88 full climate stations uh, put throughout Hawaii um, in, in various areas. And I was talking to Tom last week and I was, you know, we were talking about this, okay, well, we might know where they need to go but that doesn't solve uh, the problem. If, if we get the proposal, if it gets funded and we have 88 climate stations, these are full stations, you need to have some other elements come into play. You need, needs to be in a priority location, but you also need access to that location. And then you need it to be in a safe spot and you need a cooperation from a partner. And I thought that, you know, I've mentioned this to some of you on the call, but uh, we might be reaching back out to you and saying, hey, um, we've identified, uh, this area, you're the land manager, and we're wondering if you want a, a climate station there. It's no cost um, in terms of monetary, but it could be a cost in terms of, of helping us out, maybe do some service or some general, or just provide access, open a gate, things like that. So again, it's a proposal now, um, but I think the ball doesn't stop here. If this proposal doesn't go through, there'll be another. This is something that's been a dream of, of uh, Tom Giambaluca since I met him, and I think that at some point there's gonna be a a diverser um, you know, climate monitoring system across the state. And all of this data will be telemetered and will feed into the central Hawaii climate data portal. And if you think that you might not need climate data, I just wanna point out that just because it's the data coming there, all this data informs the products that we make, the maps, the analysis. So when there's a data uh, station on your site, it definitely gives you that added resolution of you know, instead of having information come from a different area, it comes from that area. So there's a lot of incentive to have that if you are using these gridded products and do want to find out more about what's going on your site. So again, if you catch an email from me in the next five or five months or so saying ask me about this, you'll you'll know it's coming. So so thanks again, everybody. Mahalo, Ryan, and um, a huge mahalo to Ryan and Christian and Abby and Elliot and Katie and Heather, and of course, everyone from the Southwest Climate Hub team and NIACS who has helped put this course together because it wouldn't have been possible without all of their help and support getting everything ready for this course. And then again, a huge mahalo to all of you for all of your expertise and sharing your knowledge with us and telling your adaptation stories today and throughout the last eight weeks. We really appreciate it. And so we do hope that you continue to engage with us around climate adaptation efforts and, um, and be involved in things like the monitoring program Ryan just talked about and the Pacific Drought Knowledge Exchange and sharing your adaptation story as a demonstration project as well. So if you are interested in those things, feel free to reach out to us at any time. And um, again, thank you all so much. And it was great getting to know all of you throughout this course. Thank you, Courtney. Awesome job facilitating this and making us all feel like Ohana here. So um, really, really appreciate this effort. <laughs>